So let me introduce our last speaker. This, oh, before I introduce our last speaker, actually, I have a couple announcements. So number one, there's a happy hour after the talk. We'll be in the patio. Uh, number two, tomorrow, registration. You have to go through the door, again, to go through security and enter. So that's the only entrance tomorrow morning. Not register, just uh, enter, because we have to pass through security. All right, so now let me introduce Chris Lafra. He's a software engineer at Google. He will give in the talk, well, it says Python algorithm visualization in the browser, but I guess his slides say something else. I guess there might be some interesting story. So Chris has worked on various programming frameworks, tools, and projects, and you can tell by all the cool stickers that they are, and uh, it's kind of nice that most of them are Python now, so yes, good. Uh, so he has worked on various tools, ended up writing numerous profiling and visualization tools for Procol, Smalltalk, JavaScript, C++, Java, EGL, and Python. And right now, the latest series is uh, Pi Algovis. So for, without further ado, Chris. Thank you, Diana. Um, so yes, the, uh, this is the um, last talk before we have beers. So I mean, in between you and beers. Um, so I thought, like, how can I make this talk interesting? Uh, this is like the last talk of the day. You all must be really tired and uh, phased out. So this is actually going to be three talks in one. Uh, so I'm going to do three talks in parallel. Um, so one theme is Python algorithm visualization. The other one is how I got my job. And then the third one is jokes, because we need some jokes to actually get uh, warmed up during this talk. All right, so I um, presented, um, so my, yeah, my name is Chris Lafra. I uh, joined Google six weeks ago. Uh, before that, I worked at Bank of America, where we built a huge stack of uh, trading applications, frameworks, uh, all in Python at the time. Uh, when I left, we had about 15 million lines of Python written of trading applications on top of that architecture. And I did a lot of uh, training inside the bank in Python. Um, but I couldn't talk about all of that topic uh, when I started interviewing with other companies. So Python algorithm visualization is really my, my business card, basically, to get into those interviews and talk to people about things that I built. Um, I found out that it doesn't really scale well on the uh, display that I have here, because I didn't expect the projectors to be so awesome as they are here. Um, so I changed my, my whole presentation environment uh, to run best on these things. So uh, let's see how far that goes. My entire talk will be demos, so there will be very few slides. Um, and I like to show you a lot of like Python code and see how that visualizes. Um, so this is one of the three talks, the, uh, how, you, how you get hired. So if you want to get a good job at a large organization or a technical company, it doesn't have to be Google, it can be Facebook like here or uh, uh, like the host of this uh, event. You basically need these three pillars of excellence, I call them. Uh, so you need to know uh, the technology, you need to know the theory basically, you need to know what uh, a sorting algorithm is. Uh, and why it exists and what the trade-offs are of space-time, then uh, that knowledge is useless unless you have actually used it in practice if you have built real systems. So on the left, it's like watching NBA games uh, and knowing all the stars in the NBA. The one in the middle is you actually having played in high school and college and having like, played at least 10,000 hours of, of basketball. Those are two different things. Uh, often we get people in that try to get a job uh, in my previous organization. Um, and, and they have a computer science degree, and they come in to become a programmer, and they don't know how to program. It's just unbelievable. Uh, so that, that is something you want to filter out in these interviews. That's why you have to do these tests on the whiteboard, just to see if you can program. It's like, yeah, OK. Um, so those two things, if you know them, if you know your theory, and you, and you have done a lot of coding or hacking or whatever, it still doesn't mean that you will be successful in a large organization. Um, to be really successful there, you have to enable other people. You have to manipulate other people, if you want to call it that. Um, so you have to be self-aware. You have to know what your limitations are, what your strengths are. And this is why we ask questions in interviews like, 
so, so tell me about your strengths and weaknesses. So the only reason we, uh, we like th those, those questions are asked is to see, are you self-aware and do you know how to fix your own uh, limitations and how do you enable other people and grow other people? I found that the best way of learning, by the way, is actually to sign up for talks like this. Uh, you don't have to go to a, a larger audience, but you can start at a, at a meetup, for instance. Uh, so if you have a hobby, just talk about your hobby at a, at a meetup. Uh, the next step up would be writing a book on a topic. So if you want to learn something about a particular topic, sign up to uh, publish a book on this. That will really focus your attention to learning the material. <laughs> Um, a blog is somewhere in the middle, and these days you can, there's, there's many ways of like demonstrating your knowledge of a topic and use that as a sort of a, a motivator to get going. So this brings the two together, uh, the two talks without the jokes. Um, so I started learning algorithms because the last time I did a sorting algorithm was 20 years ago. And I thought, like, if I'm at the whiteboard and I have to explain the difference between merge sort and quit sort, I have no idea. So I, I started studying, but I can't read technical books anymore. I don't know you guys, but if I buy a book, you know, about halfway, <laughs> okay, I want to do some actual coding. So I started practicing the algorithms. But then I thought, like, that's a waste. I'm, I'm writing these algorithms. I'm throwing them away. And I still don't know how merge sort relates to quick sort. So I, I started drawing pictures, basically. Um, and I wanted to automate that, want to store them somewhere. So then I uh, got a hold of uh, Google App Engine, and that's where I post both my algorithms and the visualization scripts, which I will demonstrate now and show you all the, uh, the ins and outs of it. So this poster I presented a couple weeks ago at PyCon in Montreal, and I was invited to give a talk uh, on the topic here. So that's why we're standing here now. So these blue buttons are demos. So I will do demos live. And the site itself, so the, the presentation here is especially done for, uh, for this talk here. But normally, it will look like this. So you go to PyAlgoVis. There's about 50 algorithms here. And if you click on one of them, so for instance, uh, PyArgimedes, then uh, it will bring up. The editor on the left, make the font a bit, a bit bigger. So the editor on the left, visualization script on the bottom, and you can play back the execution here so you can look back in time. And there's also sound involved, so you can play some uh, beeps in there. Okay, so I do the same thing here. But now I, I just rearrange the, the, the tiles a little bit differently. So you get a little bit bigger font and a bigger picture on the right. So on the left is the algorithm. So these are the steps that you have to go through to get a good job. And how we visualize that is by drawing letters in different colors. So let's start with a real algorithm. So bubble sort. We all know bubble sort. Um, I really still don't really know how it works, but this is the algorithm. Um, so there's a for loop, and there's another for loop, and you compare two numbers, and if the one is bigger than the other, you do something. You swap them around. So exactly how it goes, like does it go from right to left, left to right, and, and how does this work? Uh, that's hard to predict. So let's start visualizing this. So we don't have a visualization yet. I want to show you what's going on inside. So the simplest thing is to say I'm going to show the state of the algorithm, which is captured really in the, in the variable called data. So you can see I have a, a list here that I populate with random numbers between 0 and 10. And I take 10 of them. So I'm basically sorting the numbers uh, 0 to 10, to 9, sorry. Range is uh, up to 9. <laughs> So data, at some point, if you like, imagine you set a breakpoint in this code and you enter at line, line four and you're somewhere halfway in the sorting algorithm. Then if you look at data, like that array, you can visualize the, the values and then you have a feeling of where we are. Then you go to the next line and you do this again and again and again and again. Uh, and if you put all these pictures together, you get a, you get a movie, basically. So let's do that. Um, so here for script, I'm going to say, so the simplest way of visualizing this algorithm 
is to say, just represent it as a, as a text. So you could see it uh, walk by. You can um, go back in time. So I can drag the slider here. And if I show the algorithm, you can see where we were in the algorithm at that point in time. So it, yeah, it starts off all the way to the left and then runs for a while, runs for a while, and then it's done. So the text is a little bit small, but it does show you the state. So let's make it a little bit bigger. So let's try 25 pixels. It's a bit better. Um, we can try a different font as well, and maybe a uh, different color. So you get, you get control, basically, the position, the color, and the text uh, in this declarative session here. So how this works is that uh, imagine setting a breakpoint at each line. And at each line that runs, we run this script. And then we record them all and then replay them. So we have 130 steps. And we start off all the way to the left where it's mangled up. And if you progress in time, you get to the end. It's eventually, it's sorted numbers. So that's step one. Um, step two is um, show each of the value as a rectangle to make a bar graph. So now we're going to make our own bar chart uh, out of nothing. So first of all, we want the rectangle. And let me move this one a little bit uh, higher so it doesn't sit in the way. So I'm going to make a rectangle at position 100, 100. Uh, let's do 400 wide and 250 high. Let's see what I get. So I got that rectangle there. That looks good. Uh, this one maybe at 50. So there's an event listener that looks at my script. And as soon as it changes, it redraws the entire visualization. This runs on a server. It doesn't run here. So every time I make a change, it gets sent to a server, runs there, comes back, and then shows here. So this is the beginning of my bar, bar graph. So now I need to render each different value in that array. So let's do a for loop for, uh, I want to know which one it is and what the value is. So I'm going to use an enumeration uh, and enumerate. And I'm going to run over the data elements. And then for each one, I'm going to draw, draw another rectangle. So where am I going to draw the rectangles? They're going to be in this, in this box here from left to right. So the x will be a value of, uh, well, we start at 100. And then uh, n is the number of the bar that we're drawing. So here I can say n times. Um, so I have 400, so I got 10, so 40 in total. And then the y is, let's start at the top. So that's like 100. And then how high will it be? That will be, um, the height will be basically the value uh, over this area. So it's between 0 and 10. And I totally have 150. So let's do 15 times n of value here. So let's see what that gives me. So there's my bar chart. It actually works. It goes uh, up and down. The, the one with 0 is hardly visible. So let's make that, um, let's introduce a variable that makes it easier to uh, handle this. So the height is 15 times v. And so let's replace that variable there. So you can, you can do any Python in this, in this script. It just runs in the same context as the original code. I can refer to all the variables in the original code as well. And zero doesn't show up, so let's just add three. So then at least we got that little, little bar there that we know that it has a value. You can see that one here now. So that works. It's a bit controversial. And like, like normally, we draw bar charts upwards, right? So let's change the location there. So we need a y coordinate, and that would be uh, let's see, we're 100 to 350 minus v. So that's the, sorry, the height. And then rather than the fixed 100, we'll make it at that location. So we're getting close, you can see. Um, I can use up more space. So rather than um, 15, let's try 22. That's a bit better. So you can now immediately see that 
the algorithm works well. I mean, it sorts. So yes, we got it working. Um, actually, this was a big thing for me because I was trying to re-implement all these sorting algorithms. And often you make a mistake, like an edge condition, and especially merge sort and binary search has that, has that problem. Uh, so drawing a visualization is a, is a really good reassurance that the, uh, the code is there. I almost typed in DD because I have VI binding, bindings in the other one, so I've got to unlearn that right now for the demo. But uh, Okay, so we have, we have this working, and so the next step says uh, show the current values of Y and J. So if you see here, the two loops, uh, one is a variable called I and the other one is J. So if I see those values, I can actually go see them like go left and right. So that would be a good thing to visualize. So what I really want to do is rather than draw just a rectangle, I want us to show the color uh, with a different one. So let's already introduce that. So if you wonder like what, what things can you actually draw? So we have a text and a rectangle. So these are the primitives that you can use. So we have text, line, rect, circle, arc, and bar chart. And these were the only the, the primitives that I came up with, just rather arbitrary. But these are the ones that I needed to do the, the 50 algorithms. And I think you don't need a whole lot more than that. So it's, um... all right, let's go back to our code. So we, we need a color variable now. So the color, uh, let's make it red uh, if n equals i. And else make it uh, green uh, if n equals J, and else make it uh, light gray. So now we can see how the I and J actually m meet each other in the middle somewhere. And everything works, yes, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, of course it works. Um, so I really constructed a bar chart here, but we have a built-in bar chart, so let's forget about all that crap there. You can just say bar chart 100, 100, uh, 400 wide, uh, 250 high over data. Uh, is the syntax correct? Uh, bar chart x and y. Did I make a typo? Um, hmm. I think I'm failing my. Uh, oh, there it is. Um, it's a little small. You can see that the numbers are a little tiny there. So there's another parameter in bar chart that says scale. So the scale, you can uh, change that. So I can say uh, scale is uh, 30. Let's see if that's better. Uh, it's almost there. 25. That's nice. Um, this will also let me scale up a bit better if I have more than 10, let's do uh, 30 numbers. Oh, then uh, my range. So normally I would make a function here that calculates the maximum and then, but now I just hard code it and let's say seven. So another one is uh, you can highlight one of the bars that's built into the bar chart. Uh, so the highlight is a, a variable. So here I can say um, highlight equals i. And then you can see where red is going. So you can combine the technique I had before with this technique and show you uh, some extra, which we'll show you in the next uh, couple slides. Okay, and the last one is more a logical test. So uh, show if the algorithm actually works. Um, so we're gonna print a text and it's going to say, okay, if sorted of data actually is data, uh, else uh, fail. Uh, we need to put it somewhere. Um, so let's put it, um, let's see, 50 and 450, does that work? All right, the font is a bit small, but you can see, like it was failing all the time. Let's go back in time. So at some point, we get almost to the end of the algorithm. It's already sorted by now, but we're not done yet because we haven't verified. So you can, uh, you can proceed. 
Uh, you can also change the speed here, so I could say like slow, and then just say play, and then it keeps from playing from there on. And if you want to make it really small, slow, you can say snail. And then there's also molasses, but we won't run the whole thing in molasses. That takes a really long time. Um, you can also do a beep here, so I can say uh, let's generate a sound at a certain frequency. Um, so something hear hearable is probably in the thousand range, uh, n times, so i times 100. And let's do this for 500 milliseconds. I was still in molasses. Um, medium. All right. uh, you can change that frequency, like if you uh, make it like uh, just uh, so it's all a little bit lower now. Uh, if you make a J, then you get a different pattern. You can do this for hours. <laughs> All right, so those were the primitives. Um, so the third part of the, of the uh, talk is jokes. Um, and it's really hard to make jokes because you offend people all the time. Uh, so you cannot make any discriminatory jokes, not about other people. But I think you can make jokes about other programming languages. That, that's OK. I would think so. Um, so I'm going to make a lot of jokes about other programming languages. Uh, so this one is about Java. I actually like Java, but it's like we all like to hate other languages as Python programmers. So this algorithm is 2,300 years old. Um, so it's not something new that we do, algorithms. This is actually invented by uh, um, a Greekian guy in, uh, yeah, yeah, 300 years before Christ was born. And uh, the interesting part about the algorithm is that it was hard to solve a topological problem. Like, People had a hint that uh, there was a relation between the the, uh, uh, the radius of a circle and the circumference. And they all thought like it was around three. And actually, for a long time, people, it was a rule, it was three. Um, and so Archimedes wanted to figure out like what it was. And he, the interesting part about his approach is that he turned the topological problem into an algorithmic problem. So he turned it into a mathematical problem, basically. And all he did was, was calculate in numbers. And he got really close, actually. Um, so I do like six here, and the number of sides is 128. Uh, he got as close as 96. And by hand, this is a lot of work, like 2,300 years ago. Um, so he got really close, actually, to estimating the value of pi. So the algorithm here, it basically just, like, if you go back here, so you see the value of visualization here. So I can explain it by showing you pictures. That's uh, so much easier than showing you the code. Uh, the code is there on the left, but who cares? Um, so you start off with uh, four sides uh, yeah, here. So now you're calculating pi, so you have four edges. So of course, we're way off, like it's 1.5. Uh, we're not even close. So we start like going to the right, and, and the closer we get, like, and then we have 4 and then 16. Um, so you basically just calculate the length of this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and then you add them all up, and then you come to uh, a value for pi. And eventually, if you get like really to the side, like uh, 6. So let's do a little bit higher than that, like uh, 8. I have to rerun it. There were interesting uh, more patterns as well in this. Uh, you start, you see these, like you get these really weird, like this one here, this one line is like, it's bizarre. Anyway, um, so that's um, one way of calculating pi. Uh, the other one, this one I really don't understand. <laughs> so this algorithm here, uh, this calculates pi. And this is a famous one. It's by the Chernovsky brothers. They're from Ukraine. And they did this in 1984, I believe. 
And they calculated pi to two million digits. And they did this by writing, they built their own mainframe basically, and they ran this on, in their apartment in New York. And they ran this algorithm. No idea how it works, you can see. It's factorial, decimals. Uh, all I could do is, is print out the values. It's, I couldn't like, imagine even like, how to visualize this. So this is my poor visualization here. Uh, but it gets really close. So you can see 3.1415. And if you run it on a real computer, you can go like, yeah, infinite numbers. And they get uh, pretty good. So the jokes with text, I won't, I won't read out. But uh, you can read them. So this is the third way of calculating pi. And I think this is the uniquest, uniquest, most unique one. Um, so imagine you have a table, you draw lines on the table, and then you have um, needles that you throw on the table randomly, and then you see if they touch the line or not. So here you can see some of them are red, and that means that they're touching the line. So the one on the top right here, they're actually touching this line here. And it's a little bit hard to see, but there are gray lines in there. So if you, if I zoom in a bit, uh, yeah, yeah well, okay, if I don't zoom in, um, so now you can probably see the line here. There's like a gray line there. And if you then count the total divided by the red ones, you get pi. So almost, you get almost pi. Um, and this is because Python's randomizer is not really distributed well. If you do this with a real, like, just a real table and you throw things, uh, then apparently if you go over a thousand needles or so, you get like really, really good uh, approximation of pi. So this has to do with uh, distribution, with uh, uh, probability theory, because the chance that you uh, touch one of these lines has to do with the angle and then the distance between the, the lines. And of course, the, this, this, the space in between these two is carefully chosen to be uh, twice as long as the, as the needle length. So. so you would think that this visualization is rather complex, but still, it's very simple. So this is the script to draw the thing on the right. Uh, this was one of the more elaborate ones. So this one took me probably an afternoon uh, to get. The sorting ones you do in five minutes if you show it up. Um, when I set up uh, PyAlgoVis, uh, my plan was to make it open so other people could contribute their algorithms as well. So I'll give you a few examples here of people uh, having done that. So this is by uh, Nam Win, and he does a uh, basically a substring uh, determination algorithm. So that's uh, called uh, Horsepool, the boyer moore Horsepool algorithm. And his visualization script is here. So this is a little bit, um, um, well, it's still simple. The algorithm is a little bit longer. I tried to get all my algorithms within 25 lines because I think like, if I can explain how something works in 25 lines, you can actually get it. Um, so I would do some go yeah, Python golf to make this code a little bit shorter. But that's, uh, I'm not going to complain about somebody contributing to my site, though. Um, so joke time. Um, so four, uh, four friends, uh, chemical engineer, electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, and a computer scientist. They go on a road trip. So they're on the way. Halfway, the car just stops. And the mechanical engineer says, oh, there's something wrong with the engine. Probably a piston's like there. They're getting too hot, and they don't go up in the air. And then the uh, chemical engineer starts laughing. He says, oh, no, no, of course not. It must be. Uh, must be the gasoline, like the, uh, it's been clunking up. We haven't used the car in a long time, so let's just clear out the, uh, the gasoline. And then the electrical engineer says, I have no idea. It must be the sparks plug. So it's like, yeah. And all the time, like the computer scientist is sitting in the back and saying nothing. And so the three of them, they fight for a while. And then, and then they look at the computer scientist and says, like, why aren't you speaking up? What do you think is wrong with the car? And he's just like, well, I have no idea. But I think that if we all go outside of the car, close the doors, and then come back in, it will probably work. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this is another example that somebody contributed. So this one is by King Robert King. 
And I can see why he used that user ID, because Robert King is a very common name. Uh, but uh, you can find him here. So that's, uh, and I think this algorithm is just unbelievable. So if you, if you draw uh, this shape on each of these, uh, you pick a random point and then you draw this shape on each of the lines that you find in the, uh, in the polygon here, uh, you can calculate the circumference by just adding them all up. And it's like, uh, or did the service area. So this is the algorithm. Um, again, it's, it's a little bit longer to explain here, but uh, the script itself is not that complex. So if you're interested in that, just look it up. Um, another joke. I'm putting him in more jokes because we're getting uh, towards the beer now. Um, so this one is, uh, is a Google search page. So you type in recursion. And do you see the joke? You guys see it? Oh, maybe we meant recursion. And it goes to the same page. Okay. Uh, this is another contribution by, um, I think this is called Other Eric. Not to be confused with the other Eric, uh, Eric, I don't know. Um, so other Eric, um, is this person, he, um, let, let's see, what did he do? Uh, what is this? Shannon Entropy, okay. Um, so the script here is really interesting. It just prints out elephant. So I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with Eric to, uh, to see what's wrong with the visualization, but uh, it doesn't work right now. So I probably, I probably broke it for him, sorry. OK, that, that's uh, visualization, and we had some jokes. Uh, so go back to hiring. So if you're a computer scientist like I am, I'm particularly weak at uh, seeing politics at my organization. And, and I don't like to sell myself. I don't like to, uh, I just like to build stuff and get credit for it. So. Uh, so these books really teach you how to influence other people. They're extremely helpful if you want to interview, uh, especially um, the one on the left. I actually read this book for my interviews. And it, they're, they're really interesting tips about like, uh, yeah, how you can make other people like you. So, um, And then these two books, if you have only time to read two books, read these two, because they actually are the total knowledge of the entire universe in two books. <laughs> and the one on the right is actually extremely helpful. Um, so it's a really thin book. Uh, it's like 35 pages or whatever. And uh, it's written in the 70s or so, but it's still highly valuable. And who has seen the movie Groundhog Day? Okay, who can tell me what it's about? So you think about, oh, it's, it's about a guy that wakes up every day and, is, and, and he repeats the same day over and over and over. But that's not what the movie is about. The movie is about um, him being a dork and not recognizing uh, what she likes. And then every day he's got a chance to discover a little bit more about that. And, and at the end, he's so practiced at that that she actually starts liking him, and then they fall in love, and then it's over. Um, so this is a really smart way of, of selling these books here. So go see uh, Groundhog Day again, and you will see it in different eyes. Uh, I've shown you some uh, sorting algorithms. Uh, numerical algorithms are also uh, favorite interview questions. So uh, draw me a Fibonacci function that uh, produces Fibonacci function. OK, I'll draw Fibonacci. So you start writing Fibonacci that returns like uh, A and B is 0 and 1. And while it's greater, and then you return the whole list. Um, OK, so this one is uh, contributed by somebody else. Um, I won't complain too much about it, but this is not a really Pythonic way of doing this. If you were in James Powell talk this morning uh, about uh, generators, the problem with this particular incarnation of the algorithm is that you create all the elements into a list ahead of time. So if you're asking for the first million, then I have to create an array and run all one million before I can give you the first one. 
Um, uh, the visualization doesn't show that, but uh, so that's. Uh, but it does work. It's it's, it's uh, generating the numbers here. The visualization script itself is also rather straightforward. So you draw a grid um, based on the value. You, you paint them either orange or green, and that's it. So you're interested in doing Fibonacci function in a more lazy way. There's a, a generator function. And that looks like this. So you have yield statements that yield the first one, zero, and then yield one. And then it starts yielding the next number. And you have, um, basically remember the stack frame with the state of that function at that point, and then it returns. So this will never calculate more numbers than it actually needs until you start asking for the next one. The visualization here, um, this is the most elaborate one that I developed. Uh, this one shows you not only the Fibonacci numbers here. So we start off, it also has nice frequency. Um, so you start with the numbers here and you go up. And if you divide the top one by the previous one, you get this number. And the closer you get, like at some point it starts to level off. So we don't really need to go any further than this. If, if this is the precision that we're after. And this is a very special number, so this is called the golden ratio, and that this is like the broccoli number. You see that everywhere in seashells and whatever. So this is the meaning of life here. The meaning of life in uh, seven lines of Python. Uh, the script gets a little bit more complex here, so I break my own rule, uh, 39 lines. But I have rotation in here and spinning and sound, so. Okay, so that's the numbers. Uh, talking about numbers. Uh, another one is, uh, is uh, topology and uh, Mandelbrot. So Mandelbrot is famous for, uh, uh, for having really nice fractals. And this is an algorithm for generating fractals. Uh, so I don't even know how it works. It has this uh, for loops and it uh, has an imaginary part. So I didn't write this algorithm. I found this on uh, this page here. But I did write the visualization. So how does that work? Um, it's pretty straightforward, actually. If you have the numbers, you just have two for loops and you draw rectangles with different colors. And the colors are basically uh, a function of their value. So I, um, I emphasize here blue. As you can see, blue gets a better ratio of the number. So if you change that ratio, so like 18, 12, 4, so let's make that 12. I'm just winging this. I didn't even, never even tried this before. So uh, I would imagine that the picture would be more red now. Uh, it's actually more gray. OK. Um, but you can play with the numbers there. Oh, green. Huh? OK. It's more green now. Yeah, it was green. Yes, yes, of course, green. Did I say red? And often um, in interview, this is also a popular question, is how do you generate the first 100 prime numbers? And the naive one would be, oh, say, so to know if 47 is a prime number, you have to see if you can divide it by three, by four, by five, by six. And then you, you have this for loop that tries to see if uh, one of these numbers is a divisor of the, the number you're after. And if you write that up, then the interviewer will ask you, like, well, is there a way to do this a little bit faster? And yeah, I don't have to go all the way, of course. I can stop halfway. And then later on, you discover you don't really have to stop halfway. You can even stop earlier. And, and then if you realize that if you know um, all the prime numbers before, then you can use those prime numbers to see if your number is a prime number. Um, and then you can make it a generator function, so it only produces the next. So this is like an elaboration of different steps of your uh, reduction of the complexity of the algorithm and, and do a careful space-time trade-off. So the practice of remembering previous values to come up with the next one that is usually called dynamic programming, and you use that as well in, in more elaborate algorithms that we'll hopefully have time for. 
So patterns are ubiquitous, and that's the whole idea about visualization, is that you see unexpected patterns. Um, so who has to, had to do FizzBuzz in an interview? Anybody? Yes, one, two, three, four, yes. Uh, so I think VisBuzz was invented by Facebook. Uh, FizzBuzz, Facebook. Uh, why else would you do F, F, and B? Because you can see like it all leads up to FB, Facebook, right? So. Uh, and by visualizing this, you can see the patterns. So you can see the blue one is the F, the B, F, B, F, B. And then when they're all together, like three and five together, then we see F, B. Um, so the visualization here is basically just a loop. And I draw these numbers and I set different colors if they're, and I say 15, so I do 15 per column. I can also try nine, gives you a different pattern. So now it's nine high, so the pattern is a little, a little bit more, yeah, messed up. Uh, so then the pattern is like F, 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 Facebook, F, 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 Facebook. <laughs> so, uh, um, Fizzbuzz, I mean, sir. Okay, not a joke. Um, day is long. Um, Java programmer and a Python programmer, uh, they both have to go to the bank to get some money. So they walk into the bank, and there's a long line. Uh, so they're waiting in line. And all of a sudden, they hear a lot of noise at the entrance of the bank. So they look around, and there's this guy running in with a gun in his hand and a, like a mask on his. And, and he's like, he's going to say, like, hold up all your hands. And when he does that, he raises his, his, his mask so you can see his face. So everybody's like staring at him, like, what kind of robber is that? So he walks up to the first person, and he says, like, did you see my face? And the person says, yeah, it was kind of obvious, right? So he shoots him down. So he walks up to the next person, did you see my face? And the guy says, yeah, I was like, uh, sure, he <laughs> screeched him down. So he walks up to the Python programmer and he says like, did you see my face? And he says like, no, but the Java programmer did. <laughs> okay, sorting, back to sorting. Uh, we're gonna do some graphs later on as well. And this is uh, an algorithm called comb sort. And as you can see from the visualization, it's, it's sort of a linear search. So you go back and forth, back and forth until everything is sorted. Um, so there's two kinds of ways of sorting algorithms. Uh, one is that, that up and down and, and going over things and you insert values in other places. Um, and the other one is divide and conquer where you split up the problem in different parts. So you will see the difference in, in the algorithms show up in uh, the visualizations as well. So that's comb sort. This is cocktail sort. And I was thinking cocktail sorts. That's probably uh, you have drinks. So let's visualize them as glasses that are drinking. And it almost looks like a party, right? They're like coming together. And so the visualization for that is not too hard. You can see uh, I use a bar chart as we did earlier in the in the, the first exercise. And I draw some extra stuff on the bottom here. I show some numbers so you can see the values. And these glasses are drawn like little lines here. So a blue line and a red line makes up a glass. Um, so you can see this script runs at every single line here, whatever it runs. So we go back in time here. So for each frame, we're redrawing this entire picture here. So the entire bar chart is drawn in SVG in JavaScript with rectangles and with text and lines and whatever. So I think that's really amazing that like the speed with which you can do things in JavaScript these days. Uh, Gnome Sword is uh, invented by a, a professor of mine at the Free University of Amsterdam. And that's why I call it Kabouter Sword, which is the Dutch name for Gnome. So again, it's, it's the same uh, elaboration on bubble sort. You go from left to right and you figure out which ones to replace and insert where. So this is all an insertion sort uh, elaboration. Um, so this is a very generic joke. You can use this in your daily work. Uh, just substitute the word regular expression with something else. Uh, my favorite one is XML, um, uh, CSV. Like, so come up with, with 
an acronym and you can reuse it. Um, another, people, uh, another person asked me, like, uh, so, wow, this, this visualization stuff you build is really amazing. I was like, how long did it take you to build this? And then I say, 25 years. And they laugh. But this is true. So this I did in 1994. And this is a visual debugger. Uh, at the time that we didn't even have colors on monitors. So this is all black and white. It's not because it came out of a paper, but this is really the colors that we had, grayscale. Um, and this shows you, like, yeah, in the time, novel things. Like, I, uh, I instrumented every single function that run in, inside of this C++ program and then draw uh, a pixel here for each line, each function that you draw. So I basically give you a hash code for each function, and you start to see patterns there. So if something happens, I also show you which objects call which other objects. Um, and since that time, I've actually been looking for what Peter Norvig called, like I had a call with uh, Peter last week. He, he works at Google as well. And he called it, what you're looking for is an understanding language, basically. So I've been searching for an understanding language for the last 25 years. I guess. And the one I found is, is called Python, you can see. Uh, this was my experiment uh, in 94. So I have the code on the top left, and then I have my understanding language on the bottom left, and then my visualization on the right. So this starts to look like the stuff that we've seen already, right? So I have some state on top, you can call it model. And then at the bottom I have a declarative visualization. You can call that a view. And whenever the model changes, the view updates. Uh, and that's uh, a very powerful way of, of symbolically visualizing code by having the declarative binding between your, uh, your state and your visualization. So this one shows you an elevator simulation, uh, which is like really impossible to view uh, from looking at the code and from setting breakpoints. You couldn't really see the problem, what was wrong with the algorithm. Uh, this one is a little bit uh, in the middle, so not 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And I worked on the Eclipse project. I wanted to understand how plugins interacted with each other. And I just had a young son who was into gaming, starting to like buzz light year. And I thought, like, OK, I'm going to use lasers, and I'm going to have planets for each of the plugins. So each plugin is a, is, a, is a planet here. And when they communicate, they send lasers to each other. And this is really an execution pattern. So while Eclipse was running, you could see who was interacting with what. And then you can double click on UI and then see and set breakpoints in the code. And then it became a normal debugger. So you can see this has been a hobby for a long time. So the generic one is called insertion sort. Um, so here you can see how it works. So let's stop time like somewhere here. Um, the one on 22 is the red one. 23 is a really small one, so that's out of order. That has to go somewhere on the left, but we don't know yet where. So the algorithm will have to search, and it's actually walking leftwards to find the right spot for that one. OK, that was the previous one. But now we get to the little red one. So we'll have to move this all the way to the left. So you can see it's finding, trying to find the correct spot for it. And if you see what it's doing, it's actually doing linear search. And we all know how bad linear search is. So what's, best, what's better than linear search? That's binary search, yes. Um, so all sorting algorithms have been invented in the 50s, in the 60s, literally. That's where all of them came out of that time frame. So doing the visualization stuff that I've done uh, for this PyAlgoVis, I think I came up with a unique new one. So this is binary search insert sort, and I call it bus sort. Um, so we go back to the same state. Uh, let's see if I can rewind it here. Yeah. It's about there. So we see the problem here. We have a small one here, and we have to find the right spot. So it should go all the way to the left. I think that was the find the spot already. So that's there. So 
So I've got to find a spot for this number here. And so rather than do a linear search, as you saw in the beginning, we're actually doing binary search here. And binary search is between zero and the previous one. Because by, by the time we get to like number 19, we know that everything between zero and 18 is already sorted. So we don't have to do linear search. We can actually find the right spot a lot faster. So that's uh, insertion sort. Divide and conquer works differently. Is you split up the um, search problem into different areas. So if you saw it come by, I'll run it again. So this is recursively doing portions of the sorting algorithm. So you split it up in two, you split it up in two, split it up in two, you sort that, and then you merge with the other ones. Uh, so you can see essentially here it's merge sort is two recursive calls and then merge the two results. Uh, the other one is quick sort and an interesting one sits sort of in the middle which is heap sort. And if you use a, uh, a heap queue, which is a data structure to store things in a tree uh, in a certain order where you can say like give me the minimum value back and give me the maximum value back. And that heap queue can be used in that way as a what's called a priority queue. So if you have to schedule jobs, you can put them all in there, and then you can say, give me the first one. And then you will do a fair distribution, uh, with the one with the highest priority. So the priority here is defined by the value. Um, so you can use a heap queue here, which is really an interesting array. It's a special array where the numbers are organized in such a way uh, that on the first level you have one number, on the next level you have two numbers, and then the, the next level you have four numbers. So if you look at it from left to right, uh, this would be your first level, and this would be your second level, and then you get the third level, and then the fourth level, and so on. So the heap queue is nothing more than a list. It's a very efficient data. For data-wise, it's a very efficient data structure. And it uses it with indexing to use it as a sort of hierarchical data structure. You can also answer the question like, what's your minimum value? And then you take that out. So if you build a heap queue like this, and then you take the first number out, let's see where we get to the end. Yeah, now we're done. So now I'm going to pop out the numbers here. You can see heap pop, heap. So that gives me the, the one with the highest priority, which is the one with the lowest number. So we start off with one. So one disappeared, now two is the top one, and then the tree gets rebalanced. The tree, the heap queue gets reordered so that it's in balance again. And that goes on, so, so you can then extract all the numbers, and then if you added them up in a list like we do here, you get a sorted result. So this is a very complex way of doing sorting, basically. <clears throat> Okay, nobody's laughing anymore. I need better jokes. Um, quick sort is another um, divide and conquer algorithm. This one is much more difficult to visualize than merge sort, for instance, which just splits it up and then merges it. You can see the patterns there. Uh, what we do here is we, we take a random number out of the lists of things that we have to sort, and then we take all the ones that are less than that number and all the ones that are right, uh, bigger than that number, and then we basically do recursion. So you can see uh, quick sort on the left parts and quick sort on the right part. And yeah, you, you really need to visualize this as a tree, and I didn't come up with the right one yet. So like this. OK, it looks cool, and it gives you a nice sound, but it doesn't really tell you how the algorithm works. That's, uh, so I wasn't, I'm not really too happy with this, this one here. Um, there's an improvement over quick sort, and this was uh, done uh, in 1968 or something, or 78. Um, we're all like we're all too late in the game. Like if we would have worked on this in the 70s, then we could have made it up. But uh, now it's uh, Sedgwick who came up with this. He said like, well, rather than take a random number, let's take one uh, 
like 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 a range, and then let's see, and uh, maybe maybe we can get a better result. So we got a far better result there. Um, we can see it's uh, still recursive, so it calls recursive numbers there. So to understand recursion, you have to understand recursion. Um, so this is also a typical question in interviews. Um, so they make you write something recursive like Fibonacci, and then they tell you like, can you make this a non-recursive version? So then you have to understand how stacks work, basically. So we have a stack here, I call it work, and I push work uh, onto the stack, and when I wanna get the next one off, I say pop. And I met uh, Raymond Hediger at PyCon, and he came up to me, and he ran up to me, and he says like, I wrote that, and he pointed at my T-shirt, and I said, no, 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 I wrote that. No, 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 I wrote that, and he pointed at enumerate. So uh, he wrote the enumerate function. And when he saw this example, he said like, oh, please, can you not use pop zero? Please use a DAC. And so, so I still have to rewrite this one uh, to satisfy him. But uh, you can see this is the quicksort algorithm without recursion. There's no recursive calls to quicksort. So why would you do this? Like, why would you make it so much more complex, your, your code here? This is more complex than the previous one, which is much more readable. Um, but the problem with the recursive one is that you may run out of stack space. Uh, there's, a, there's a certain limit of how deep languages will allow you to make recursive calls. And sometimes your data structure is just too big to do in a recursion, and then you have to think about like how can I avoid the recursion by doing my own stack management, basically. So by now, you must be wondering how all this works, I hope. Um, so the way it works is you have this editor, uh, text editor on top, which is implemented in CodeMirror. Um, that's a JavaScript library to allow you to uh, edit code in the browser. And it's really advanced. It even has uh, Vim bindings, uh, so you can do v v uh, VI key bindings. And the bottom one is also a uh, CodeMirror. When the code sends to the browser, it comes back eventually, I render it. Um, in HTML5 using Canvas and D3.js. So how does it work on the, uh, on the server side? So on the server side, we receive the uh, request for the algorithm and the visualization script. And I run that in a sandbox. So there's a special piece of Python that I wrote to make sure that you don't import sys and then you can't uh, go to the file system, you can't open URLs, uh, things like that. And then I record every single line. So in Python, there's a really cool feature. If you haven't seen this yet, look it up. It's called sys.setrace, where you can very quickly define your own function that is uh, called for every single line in your code. Then you can set a filter, and you can say, I only want to like, look at the stuff that runs in the script that I'm actually interested in, not in the libraries down uh, in the code. And I see I have one minute left. Oh, dear. Uh, um, and then you render it, uh, eventually send it back to the browser. So the pseudocode looks like this. Um, I define a sandbox. I use um, uh, yeah, quite interesting uh, Python constructs that are like context managers, monkey patching. Um, I uh, measure how long it takes. So if you take more than 10 seconds, I actually stop you. And this all runs on the browser. Um, so I showed this to a colleague of mine at Google. Uh, he started the same day as I did. Um, and he said like, oh, this is cool stuff. Let me uh, try and break in. Uh, OK. So it took him five minutes. Um, oh, dear. Uh, let me fix that one. And then it took him 10 minutes. OK. Um, uh, I didn't think of that. OK, uh, half an hour. And so the last time I blocked it up, he didn't get in. So anybody here who gets in, um, yeah, I don't know. I have to find a price. but. I'll, I'll buy you a beer tonight or something. Um, but then he sent me this meme, so I think that's, uh, uh, we, we all like memes in, uh, in Google, so that's. Uh... Um, graphs are cool, so I'll just quickly show you the, uh, the end result. So this is Dijkstra, uh, which is basically an envelope of things that you look for and you, for each one you extend uh, the envelope with the minimum uh, one that you can find. 
And this is an approximation of uh, finding the shortest path. Uh, there's different algorithms that you can try. Convex hulls is a, is a nice one. This is also contributed by somebody else. I didn't write this, um, which finds the uh, enclosure of a graph, basically. The um, uh, minimum spanning tree is another one, which is a classic graph or algorithm. So you can see the algorithm is pretty short. It's like 10 lines. Uh, visualization gets a little bit more complex, but still OK. Um, I didn't plan to be viral. I just wrote this thing. And at some point, somebody sent this to Facebook uh, to all his friends. And they, start, they all started hammering my server at the same time. And then, uh, because I signed up for the free program, I'm Dutch, so you try the free one first. Um, it actually brought down my server. So I got an email that says, like, uh, you ran out of budget. And so I went there. Three clicks later, uh, I just enabled billing. And since then, I paid $1. So that's OK. okay. Um, so that's the nice thing about uh, Google App Engine is that you can very quickly uh, react to, to changes. And it's all transparent. I mean, I just enable billing. You can choose what kind of server you like, and it all works automatically. All right, this is another one. Um, there's this, uh, I don't know if you've seen this in the past. If you recognize this one or not. So there's uh, somebody uploaded 70,000 or 80,000 videos of 11 seconds each. And this is the original one at YouTube. OK, I'll stop this now. Uh, and this is my version. So um, the script is really easy, you can see. Uh, so you draw a rectangle, you draw a rectangle, and you do a beep. So, uh, so I'm going to upload 90,000 90, of them. Like, how does that sound? Uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, there must be aliens. Like, you're saying, no, 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 it's not aliens. OK, I got a lot of more about trees. Um, so breadth first search versus depth first search. Uh, it's really interesting to see the algorithms there. So this is breadth. So you can see, like, uh, waves going up and down. Whereas if you look uh, depth first search, uh, it's much more chaotic. It goes, like, up and down like this. And the same thing if you uh, do it non-recursive. Then uh, again, you can see we use a stack. OK, I'll um, start with a final joke. Oh, this is actually a double joke. This, uh, so this uh, chemical engineer, and I could, oh, no, I already told that one. Yeah. Um, so if you're interested in uh, my work is really inspired by Brett Victor. Uh, if you have never seen his work, go look it up. It's just unbelievable. Uh, Python Tutor is also uh, very inspirational for me. Um, but I can see normal beings do this stuff. So I, I wanted to build an environment that I tried to give to you so that it's easier for you guys to build something similar. So summarizing on the uh, job hiring, this is the last slide. Um, so the theory is write books, do presentations. It's really fun. Um, go apply your work. Do something with it, uh, get some experience. And then the other part is hard, but yeah, just uh, stay calm. So thank you very much. Uh, I ran out of time for questions, but we have beers, and I'm, I'm, I'm the guy wearing the shirt, so you can come to the beers and see me there. <laughs> Do we have time for questions or not? No, we're not, no, no, yeah, I'll get a signal, no. All right, thank you. All right, everyone. The happy hour will be at the Building 15 Son of Ping and Pong foyer. Enjoy yourself.